And I'll give you one example because I don't have enough time. A recent example when the United Nations did work. And that is in Kenya. In 1997, there were elections, contested elections in Kenya, and ethnic disturbances based on competition for economic resources and for power began. And over 1,000 people were killed in inter-ethnic clashes. And it was perfectly clear that if nothing was done, this was, had every possibility of developing into a genocide. And so, who was interested in that genocide? No one. Everyone was interested in preventing it. China, Russia, the West, African countries, the Kenyan government, nobody was interested that this would develop into a genocidal situation. And so the Secretary General could send Mr. Kofi Annan to Nairobi and uh, to other countries in the neighborhood and he patched up an agreement which still holds today. It doesn't hold up very well but it holds up. This is a case where there was no one who would prevent the prevention of a genocide. But the moment you have a dispute, as you have in Sudan today, where oil concessions, about 60% of them, are owned by the Chinese, the Chinese will prevent any kind of action against the uh, continuation of the genocide in Darfur. And it does not require me to be a prophet to tell you that there is every possibility in the world that by January of next year there will begin clashes, violent clashes between North and South based on the interest of the North, of the Islamic North to occupy the South it, because the main oil wells are in the South. Some oil wells, important oil wells are also in the province of Abiyé which is between the North and the South and there will be struggle over who controls that area. Any kind of action of that kind is very likely to uh, become a genocidal situation and with a protection by China, Russia, the Arab League and some others, the Sudanese government, although its head was accused by the International Criminal Court first of crimes against humanity and then lately also of genocide, nothing is likely to happen unless there is a change of mind in the minds of the people who decide in this world of ours. Now, uh, from the Holocaust till today there have been genocides. And uh, the question is, uh, how old is this thing? Is genocide something that happened only in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st? Or is it older than that? And because, again, I don't have enough time, I will just summarize this and say, it is perfectly clear from any study of history that mass annihilation of groups of humans has occurred since time immemorial and before that. One example. In the Austrian play, in the Austrian village, a small place by Raymond Schletz, last year they discovered the remnants of over a hundred men, women and children that were murdered by other humans because the weapons with which they were killed were found there. When? about seven and a half thousand years ago. And there are other cases like that. In other words, humans are the only mammals that kill other mammals of their own kind in huge numbers from the beginning. Why? Why do they do that? I have a theory which I cannot prove because there's no way one can prove prehistoric history convincingly. But I haven't yet heard anyone who managed to counteract that theory. And I will present it to you again in a few sentences only. You see, we are, all of us, we are predators like wolves and tigers. 
and lions and bears. We exist on meat and fish. Now, it is not likely that your audience will go out into the streets of Budapest after this lecture and hunt mammoths there. There aren't any mammoths in Budapest as far as I know. But they will go to a super, uh, a, a, a shop, and buy meat and fish off the shelves. It's the same thing. We are hunters. We need meat and fish to survive. Except for a few vegetarians amongst us. We also collect. We collect grass. We eat grass. When you go, perhaps, in an intermission of this afternoon, and you have coffee and cake, what is cake? Cake is made of flour. What is flour? It's made of things that grow on green stalks, that become yellow, that are ground into flour and turned into bread and cakes and whatever. We eat grass. We eat fruits of the ground and fruits of the tree. And uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we do all that, we hunt and we collect, like our cousins, the chimpanzees, uh, the fact that we do that, we can only do it because we are weak predators, only in groups. An individual can't do that. We have to act in groups, in herds. So we create herds, whether they are family groups, or tribes, or ethnicities, or modern nations. If we don't belong to one herd, we belong to another. Now, I know there are individuals who will say, I don't belong to any herd. I am not a Hungarian. I am an individualist, a universalist. I don't belong to anyone. He, they can say that until the person from the income tax comes along and asks for income tax. And then they discover that they do belong to a group. They can't avoid it. And so what happens is that we act as groups, whether we like it or not. And when another group enters into our territory, whether it's a real territory, or a virtual territory, doesn't make any difference. We have four possibilities. One is to absorb that group, because it could strengthen us. Another possibility is to make that group that came in work for us, either as slaves or as lower people in our society. We do that all the time. The third possibility, which happens sometimes, is to tell a group like that to go away, which they sometimes do and sometimes don't. And the first possibility is to kill them. And that, those four options, if you look at history, have been exercised for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, either the one or the other and so on, or some of them together. Now, if that is so, is there any possibility of preventing genocide? Because obviously there is something within us that makes us kill. For very good reasons, if you like to put it that way, in order to survive. But if a society is built on killing, it cannot exist. And so we develop another way of reacting. Namely, support each other, help each other, because a herd, a group, whatever it is, family, clan, tribe, ethnicity, nation, in order to survive has to act together on a, on a feeling of sympathy, which can turn into love, which can turn into the Willingness to sacrifice yourself for somebody else, not only of your own group, but even of another group, because that may, instinctively, it may help you. So, there are two elements in our makeup, killing and rescuing. And they act against each other. If you look at any of the so-called holy books of any kind of culture, 
whether it's the Judeo-Christian culture, or the Muslim culture, or the Indian, or whatever, the Chinese, whatever, you will have always good and bad. Good is something that helps you, the group, in order to survive, in order to live a good life, and so on. Bad is the opposite. And we create some very real, very powerful weapons. We call them morality. It's a very important weapon and it's something that people can believe in, can trust in, can act upon. And when you have the, these, these two things acting against each other, what is the result? The result is law. Now, how do I know that humans are inclined to murder? I know that because there are laws against murder. In the Ten Commandments, you have the commandments, Thou shalt not kill. But that's not what it says. The original Hebrew says, Thou shalt not murder. Because killing is permitted. If you send young men, today also young women, in uniforms, to war, to kill who? Other young men, or possibly women, in other uniforms. It's a good thing. You encourage that. Killing is permitted murder. Murder is forbidden killing. We are murderers unless we stop ourselves. Now we can, because we have that other, other element within us. So there is a possibility of preventing genocide. But it's very, very, very difficult. 